Maybe some of you love bugs and have already gone on your Bible app and copied uh, Romans 5.8 or John 3.16, ready to post it in the comment section for me to see. As someone who's read the Bible, has been in Christianity, has evangelized open air, dealt with people publicly multiple times, yes, I've heard these verses. But if these verses uh, say what most people make it out to be, uh, what they think uh, it's saying, then it just wouldn't line up with the rest of what we're going to be talking about. It wouldn't line up with the whole Word of God. So we're going to take care of these verses right now. Romans 5.8 we're going to read Romans 5, 9 as well, the verse following. We're going to be using the NASB translation for these uh, verses here. Romans 5, 8 through 9. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9. Much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. If you are going to uh, use the us in Romans 5.8 and apply it to just all sinners, to everyone in the world, then you're going to have to use the we in Romans 5.9 where it talks about we shall be we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. You will have to use that we and apply it to everyone in the world as well. But if you're a Christian, you know that not everyone, in fact most people, will not will not be saved from the wrath to come. Okay? That's first off. Second off, you have to get the context of the us and the we. What us and we is Paul talking about here? He doesn't say everyone in the world. So what us, what group of people is Paul talking about here? If you look at the, uh, the, interju the introduction to Romans, Romans chapter 1. And if you look at the introduction of this chapter, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, uh, it makes it evident that this passage in the letter in its entirety is being written to Christians. This letter isn't for sinners. Also, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, okay? So, God demonstrated his love for Christians while they were yet sinners, okay? When they used to be a sinner because they were still part of God's elect. This is talking about the elect of God, okay? This isn't talking about the wicked that we see in Proverbs 16, 4, where it says, God has created all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of destruction. This isn't talking about the vessels of wrath. Let's move on to John 3, 16 now. Now, these two verses, Romans 5, 8 and John 3, 16, are like the only verses where it says anything along the lines of sounding like, oh, God loves sinners. So this is why we're taking care of it right now, right here. John 3, 16. Amen. NASB. NASB. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
the first part of it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This is saying that God did a loving action for the world. This doesn't mean that God loves the world. First off, look at the word here. It says loved. For God so loved has a D at the end. The loved has a D at the end. It doesn't say for God so loves or adores. If this was the case, then why would God, why would Jesus Christ tell his followers in 1 John 2.15 to love not the world nor the things in the world? If any man love the world or the things in it, the love of the Father is not in him. Why would God be telling his followers to not love the world if he loves the world? doesn't make any sense and it especially wouldn't make any sense if John 3 16 was saying what most people think it says with all the other verses we're about to go over amen now nowhere do we see Jesus or the apostles in the book of Acts walking around saying God loves you God loves you no matter what. He accepts you no matter what. We don't see him saying, God loves you. Okay? And we already got, we already went over John 3, 16, so you can't use that. When we see Jesus talking about God's love, okay, concerning him loving people for as a person, he says that if you want to be loved, by the Father and by me, you need to keep my commandments. Okay, we see this in at least three places in the book of John. Okay, John 15.10 will be the first one that we go over. First John, I mean, not first John, John 15.10. Okay, the gospel of John 15.10. This is what Jesus says. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, according to you love bug, God just loves everyone and everything, Christians. Why would Jesus be saying this if everyone is abiding in his love no matter what? Jesus says, let's read the first part again. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. There's a condition there. To be under God's, to be under Jesus's love, you have to keep his commandments. Why would Jesus say this if we're all just floating around, abiding in God's love, no matter what? It really just doesn't add up. I used to say as uh, a less, you know, not as mature as I am today, Christian. Oh, when it talks about God hating all workers of iniquity, it's talking about God the Father. Not necessarily God the Son. Well, John 15.10 solves the problem of my understanding there. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He doesn't say the Father's love. He doesn't say the Holy Spirit's love. He says my love. And of course, those are all the same love because Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they are one. But you know what I'm saying. This is literally Jesus talking, red letters, him saying, my love, abide in my love. Let's go to John 15. 
I mean, John 14. John chapter 14. Let's do verse 21 first. Jesus speaking, red letters. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Jesus is saying, for the Father to love you and for the Son to love you, you need to keep his commandments. If everyone is just under God's love and the Son's love, why would Jesus be saying this? Let's go to John 14, 23, where Jesus, he says the same thing. But it is another verse that adds to the case of uh, the situation. John 14, 23, two verses later. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Jesus isn't saying, oh, the Father, he'll, he, he already loves you. God loves you. <laughs> God loves you, sinner. No, that is not what Jesus says here. Jesus is saying to this person, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. Jesus is saying you need to keep his word for the Father to love you. Many of you people, Christians, even genuine Christians, would have a problem if I just, if I said that on the street. Man, thank goodness this verse is in the Bible. Because, you know, when you do have a problem with me, I could just pull it up. But man, if I said this verse, if I said what this verse says, and it wasn't in the Bible, man, you would have to disfell disfellowship me with me. You might even say I had a demon. And you would just have to reassure that person that I was talking to that God absolutely does love you. <laughs> Man, if I said this verse without saying that it was a verse in the Bible, in a church, man, I'd be kicked out. <sighs> Praise the Lord. In the book of Acts, the book that's after placed after the four Gospels, and, uh, and takes place uh, concerning timeline-wise after the Gospels as well. After Jesus Christ died and rose again, which, by the way, you need to repent and believe that Jesus did that to be saved. Anyways, in the book of Acts, we do not see the words love, loves loved anywhere in the book of Acts. We don't see them saying God loves you. We don't see them saying that they need to talk about God's love when they're preaching. Why is it not there? Because they're doing what 1 John 3.18 says. 1 John 3.18 Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue. God loves you. I love you. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in, tr but in deed and truth. Now, I don't have a problem with the word love <laughs> if you're using it truthfully. The only time I'm going to say that God loves you to someone is if God tells me to, and they're a Christian. Okay? So, I'm not excluding all cases. This is talking about speaking the truth. 
and when you're talking to sinners, okay? Let's read 1 John 3.18 again. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. This is what they were doing in the book of Acts. This is why Paul, when he was evangelizing one-on-one -on -one to a sinner, in Acts, what is it, 24? 24. In Acts 24, uh, verse Acts 24, verse 25, he talked about this with the sinner. It says, But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, this is talking about what Paul was saying to Felix, who we who he was evangelizing to. It doesn't say, but as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and God's love. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says, in the judgment to come. So this is what we see them falling under in the book of Acts, 1 John 3.18. This next one, man, the book of Jude, amazing. This, is, this topic isn't just concerning sinners, but this is talking about people. This is including, this. what we're going to read right here is including people who say, think, they're Christian. Okay? Or are Christian, okay? or currently Christian, at least. All right, let's go ahead and read it. Jude one twenty, starting there, moving to verse 21. Jude one twenty through 21, let's go ahead and read it. NASB. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So, so, in verse 21, we see Jude uh, exhorting the Christians, the brethren, to keep themselves in the love of God. Why would Paul be saying this if people... Nonetheless, Christians are constantly in the in within the love of God. Why would you be uh, quoting that? Hey, some of you people uh, might have to speak to Jude and say, Jude, don't you know that we're always in the love of God and uh, God loves everybody? <laughs> but Psalm one forty six. Verse 8. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. If God loves everyone, why does Psalm 146 8 say, specify that it's the righteous, that the Lord loves the righteous? Hey, according to a lot of people, a lot of Christians, David might as well just say, the Lord loves everyone. The Lord loves everyone equally. No, that's not how it is. Guess what? David also recognizes. We're going to do a little bit of precept upon precept. Okay, well, earlier in Psalms, Way earlier, towards the beginning, in chapter 5, the psalmist, it's a psalm of David, psalm chapter 5, verse 5. Let's go ahead and read it. It's David talking about God, writing about God, a man after God's own heart. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Now let's go ahead and look up this verse in uh, the NIV and the NLT for maybe some of you people that are more babes in Christ. 
So Psalm 5.5 5 says, God hates all workers of iniquity. Let's look it up in NLT and NIV. Psalm 5.5 5, NIV. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate, talking about God, the you, you, God, you hate all who do wrong. <laughs> Man. Some of you guys would have a problem with David. New Living Translation, NLT, Psalm 5.5. 5. NLT, let's read it. Therefore, the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. God hates all who does evil, according to David. You think you're more loving than David? Oh, David. God loves everybody. Man, those verses with Jesus speaking. Jesus, don't you know that God loves everybody? Man, let's go to Psalm 11.5. A few chapters later, still in the earlier parts of Psalms. So, I mean, some of you people that just love Psalms, seems like you just go right over these verses. Hey, it's right at the beginning. God put it there right at the beginning. And you still just somehow go right over them. But anyways, Psalm, Psalm 11.5, NASB. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. God's soul hates the one who loves violence, according to this verse in the NASB. Let's read this verse in the King James Version. I like it how it's worded a little bit more here. Psalm 11.5 the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his, talking about God, his soul, talking about God's soul, his soul hateth the wicked and him that loves violence, God's soul hates. What does this mean? It means when it says his soul hates, it means he absolutely abhors hates them so bad the wicked in him that loves violence man this verse a lot of people they like to use psalm 5 5 but man psalm 11 5 straight up says that god absolutely detests hates the wicked and him that loves violence. Point blank, straightforward. Nothing complicated about it. I really want to look up this verse in the NLT and the NIV. I know I will not be disappointed. Neither will you, those who love the truth. There we go. Bible hub. All right. Psalm 11.5. Where is it? Okay. Psalm 11.5 NIV. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. That's what it means when it says his soul hateth. He hates them with a passion. He doesn't just hate them. His soul hates them. He hates them with a passion. New Living Translation, Psalm 11.5. If some of you have been able to make it up to this point, unless you just are blinded, uh, then you should your eyes should be open by now to this uh, matter. Anyway, Psalm 11, 5, NLT. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. 
He hates those who love violence. Amen. Let's read the English Standard Version of this verse. I like it. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Man. Man. Some of these uh, translations are even more strong than the King James Version. So this is just one of many areas where... Uh, anyways. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says that God hates uh, a false witness that speaketh lies. <laughs> oh no, he just hates the lie, Aaron. Well, no, it says he hates the false witness who speaketh lies. The fal a false witness that speaketh lies. So you're saying that the lie is speaking the lie? No, it's talking about the false witness. It also says after that, that God hates those who cause, stir up, cause discord, division among brethren. Man, you want to try and divide a Christian from a Christian, a brother from a brother, brother from a sister in Christ? Man, if that verse is talking about uh, biological, how much more? Uh, brethren in Christ, whom God says, whom Jesus says, is your real family. Who's my mother? Who's my sister, my brother, except those that do the will of God? Now I have a special verse for any Catholics watching or any King James only believers, a verse from the Apocrypha. I say all that because the Apocrypha is in the King James 1611 version and Catholics use the Apocrypha, so uh, I'm going to use it, okay, because I can. Uh, Sirach, otherwise known as Ecclesiasticus, Sirach Ecclesiasticus 12.6 says this, For the Most High hateth sinners. And will repay vengeance unto the ungodly, and keepeth them against the mighty day of their punishment. Whoa! Wait a moment. Did you hear what was first stated in that verse? For the Most High. Who is the Most High, Christian? Is it talking about the devil hitting sinners? Who's the Most High? Oh. According to some men, according to many people's way of thinking, oh, this verse just couldn't be the Most High. But no, it says, for the Most High, I'm going to say it again, starting over, for the Most High hateth sinners. So not only have I gone using uh, what we have in the canonized Bible, uh, but I have used a verse from the Apocrypha to just a nice little cherry on the top. Anyways, praise the King. Hallelujah. So, next time that you're talking to someone who's not a Christian, instead of saying, God loves you, you can let them know that God hates them and that he has a wonderful plan for their life that if they don't repent and believe in the gospel, he's going to kill them and send them straight to the lake of fire for eternity.